everyone. I am here today to talk about motherhood, and I'm going to be really raw and honest with all of you about the mistakes that I've made as a mama and what I have learned from women who have gone before me in motherhood and have older children. Um, and this might even bless people who do have older children just based on the fact that it is all encompassing and everything that we do with our children makes an impact. The way that we live, the things that we say, and even now my relationship with my mom when I'm 30 years old is impactful for me. And so I just want to remind everyone that you do have an impact on your children, whether they're nine months old or 30 years old. And it's always important to be pruning our hearts and trying to do everything with excellence because the Lord has entrusted us with so much and that includes motherhood. So Today, I'm going to be sharing my lessons that I have learned and the massive mistakes that I have made. So let's jump in. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Living Easy Podcast, a podcast on motherhood and marriage with a biblical foundation. Um, we try to talk about everything from practical living and productivity to the really, really hard and raw stuff and the stuff people don't always talk about, like sex and fights with your spouse, all the things. So. Today, as I mentioned in the intro, we're going to be talking about motherhood. So I'm going to be looking down at my notes because I felt like this was important enough for me to really kind of study and um, practice for, I guess you can say, so that you understand my heart and you understand where I'm coming from um, and also that I can express what I'm thinking more clearly. So what I want to begin with is that motherhood is an art. It's not a science. It sanctifies us. It challenges us. It blesses us. But the beauty of it is that God gave you specifically to your children. And so I think a lot of the time we can believe the lie, at least I can, that my kids would be better off with another mom because I'm just screwing them up. I'm like, what are you going to go to therapy for? <laughs> what did I do that's going to send you to therapy? Because there's going to be something. And I'm very hard on myself. I am like, I live in mom guilt. So for those of you who feel the same, it is something I literally battle day in and day out. I was even making my bed and putting pillows up and thinking to myself, I have not spent the amount of hours one-on-one -on -one, eye to eye contact with my kids that I wanted today. And it's only like one o'clock and just feeling the weight of that burden and knowing I need to work, I need to record. And um, I just had to say for a second, Lord, like remove this from me. This is such a burden. And I want to be the perfect mom to my kids, but there's no such thing, mamas, as a perfect mom. There are a million ways to be a good mom, but there is no way to be a perfect one. And so you just have to do your best to live with excellence and, and to love them in the best way that you can. And so the beauty is that you are your child's mama. You are theirs and God gave you to them for a reason. And so you can rejoice in that and knowing that he trusts you. He's entrusted you with this gift. He's entrusted you with your kids. And it's exciting. It's encouraging to see them grow, but it's also really scary <laughs> to have that massive responsibility that we have in raising our children because they're so moldable. And as much as I joke about sending my kids to therapy, like I never want to have to do that. I want them in their 20s and their 30s to say, I had a really healthy childhood. I had a really great relationship with my parents. They were my parents first, not my friends, but I love them and I trust them. And I know that fully, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, I always have their support because that's who Jesus is, right? He loves us. He gives us grace and forgiveness again and again and again. And there's no condition on the love that he has for us. And I never, ever want to place condition on my kids. And so if, especially if you're raising little ones, I just want to encourage you to imagine it as like a little seed that you're planting in the ground and you're slowly watering and growing that seed. And every little thing, mamas, that we do and that we say makes an impact, but more importantly, what we do, right? Because what we say can be just words, vomit out of our mouth if we're not living that out. And so I think throughout this episode, I really want you to think about 
Oh man. It's, I might get emotional today because <laughs> this is like, it is just a big topic for me. It is I am constantly, not because of who I am, but because of what God has called me to, constantly trying to evaluate how to be a better mom. And I'm always feeling like I'm failing and I don't want to fail them. And again, that burden is not on me. Like I always say this and I know it's really cheesy, but do your best and Jesus will do the rest. And I have to go back there and remember that he never called me to be a perfect parent, but it's so important to me. And it's so important to me that you mamas feel the gravity and the weight of being a great mom, but also that you live in the freedom and the grace to not have it all together all the time. So this is the season that we're in right now. I'm going to take a sip of water so I don't cry myself. So I don't cry the entire episode. Um, But this is a season for planting. And later you'll see the growth. And I've seen that so much with my kids. It's actually been really cool during this isolation in being home, um, kind of seeing the fruit of the efforts that Jesse and I have put in where we feel sometimes like we are just throwing out our words and wasting our energy and our time with lecture after lecture after lecture or um, conversation after conversation and feeling like it's getting nowhere. But then little things. Okay, so here's one example so that you can understand what I'm talking about. Sutton has a tendency, my oldest, he's four and a half, almost five. He has a tendency to be a little sneaky, okay? He likes to do things his way. Um, He's a very, very well-behaved kid, and I've had very high expectations of him, which is something we're going to talk about. But because of those expectations, I do feel like he has this desire to be good and do good all the time, which is not what I want for him. I want him to want goodness because of who God is and God calls him to be, not to please me. And that's something I'm working through. However, we've talked about sneakiness. We talk about honesty. I am constantly telling my kids, you can come to me and tell me anything. You can always talk to me because I want to be able to work through this with you. I've never asked you to be perfect and you're going to sin. You're going to make mistakes. But if I can walk you through that, you're, the result is going to be a lot better and easier for all of us if we can do that. And so one of his friends um, a while back was trying to get him to do something that he wasn't supposed to do. And I was just kind of listening in to see how he would handle it. And he said, we're not a sneaky family. And I was like, "Hmm, okay. And he said, we're not a sneaky family to his friend. And his friend kept trying to convince him, do this thing. And, and Sutton said, I'm not a sneaky, I'm not in a sneaky family and we don't keep secrets. We talk to each other and tell one another things. And these are like, these are really his words, you guys. And we tell one another things. And then he said, do you want to be a sneaky person? Do you want to have a sneaky family? That's like his terminology. And the kid said, I have a sneaky family. And that made me sad. Um, But maybe he also just didn't understand And Sutton said, well, I'm not sneaky and I'm not going to do what my mom asked me not to do because I don't keep secrets from my mom. And the kid was just kind of like, okay. So for me, having put in conversation after conversation after conversation after conversation with him and feeling like I was getting nowhere because I kept seeing him choosing sin and choosing to do things that he wasn't supposed to, that was a moment of like, okay, Lord. This investment is going somewhere. It feels exhausting sometimes. It feels like so much, but it really is going somewhere. And so just to remind you, moms, like especially in this time of isolation during um, COVID-19, that you may feel like you are spinning your wheels and you're on a crazy cycle of just lecturing and conversing and disciplining and teaching, and it's not going anywhere. Just remember, one, God's word never returns void. So keep taking them back to scripture. Keep taking them back to the Bible. But also remember that the watering and the pruning is just as important as that growth because it sanctifies us as well. As they're growing and as you're raising them up and in, in investing that time and that energy, just keep that at the back of your mind or really at the forefront of your mind, <laughs> the forefront, because it will keep you sane. So here are five mistakes that I've made as a mom and what I am learning about those mistakes. 
Number one, not giving my kids the capacity or ability to have a bad day. I wake up some days and I am moody. I am grumpy. I don't want people to bother me. I'm easily agitated and frustrated. But how often do we not allow our children to do the same or have the same kind of day? So for me, I've realized with my kids that there are so many moments where they will give me attitude. They will, I don't know, just be grumpy. They'll be highly emotional. Um, My oldest is a little hyper emotional and it can be difficult for me to navigate because I'm not honestly the most merciful person. I'm kind of like, let's find a solution and move past this. And that again, as I reference back to like God pruning and sanctifying us through our kids, that is a huge way he's, he's pruned me and grown me is realizing I need to be more empathetic. I need to be more understanding and compassionate and kind. And some of you mamas may not have that issue at all. And I just admire that so much. And that's an example to me. So thank you for living that out. Um, but I've noticed in the days where my kids have heightened emotions that maybe I wouldn't give them as much grace as I would give myself. And the, Bible's, the Bible calls us to love one another as we love ourselves. So how do we love ourselves on a hard day? We give ourselves grace. We give ourselves time, alone time. We, we do something a lot of the time that we enjoy so that it can make us feel happy. We get outside. We eat well. And we don't get just mad at ourselves and just say, oh, I'm such a selfish sinner. You know, and sometimes with our kids, we might do that. Like you're being so frustrating, you're being so sinful, or you're acting out, and we lash out on them rather than having the grace that we would have on ourselves. And so, in the moment when our children are just having a bad day, which is going to be often, like we're human beings, I think we need to allow that. I want to do a quick disclaimer as I'm talking through every single one of these points. I'm not saying to accept disrespect. I'm not saying to not discipline and follow through when there is a need for discipline. But there's also a tuning in to their emotions that needs to happen. So when my kids are hungry or tired, I can navigate that right away. Like I can just see it from a mile away. And I will, I will acknowledge, okay, they're having a hard time. I need to see if there are any of these things that I can do to help before I just get immediately angry because that is my tendency, you guys. But I just get, I go from zero to a hundred and I'm just like, stop, stop talking to me like that or whatever, instead of being like, hey, let's figure this out. Sometimes there is reason to have a heightened response. I'm not saying there isn't, but to have just a consistent pattern of that response shows that there needs to be some change in a heart and so in your heart in my heart. And so when when we see our child crying and just agitated, it can be ingrained in us to just say like stop crying, figure it out or stop acting that way. But one, let us try to seek a solution that can help them. Food, sleep, rest, like alone time. Alone time is big for children. I think they really do need that that alone time if they're willing to take it. Um, but then if it goes further than that, just try to determine what do you need right now? And a lot of the time they can't communicate that, but if you're tuned into your children and can kind of determine what they're struggling with and what they need, it helps to say, okay, this is just one of those days. This is not every day. This is not the common circumstance. And if it is, then there's like time to check their heart, time to check your heart, your discipline, your consistency. But if it's less often than daily or every other day, then I think there is just a place to let them be a human being and to give them the ability to express their emotions, to give them the ability to be grumpy um, and just to be children overall and to allow them to have a bad day. Um, So that's something that I have really been working on and just navigating in my home. And I've asked Jesse to hold me accountable in that. Like, hey, if you see the kids are just crying and screaming and losing control and disrespectful, like 
help me to step back from my emotions and see that maybe they might need just a little navigating or distraction because outside works great. And so rather than reacting, I want to respond. And so I've encouraged my husband to guide me in that when he sees me reacting rather than responding. So that's something that you could do as well if your husband is home. Okay, number two, not allowing them to just be messy kids. Okay, so I do love projects. And it's so funny because I get a lot of messages from you guys um, on my Instagram stories. I have an Instagram account at lindsay.myestis and then Living Easy Podcast also on Instagram. And I show these activities that I do with my kids. I've shown us having mud fights. I've shown water balloon fights, um, paint and glue and all kinds of stuff. And I get messages often, more often than you might think, mom saying, I could never, I couldn't do it, Lindsay. I couldn't allow my kids to get in the mud. Look, they have their shoes on, Linz. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) And this is not to praise myself because I don't get in the mud. I've only gotten in the mud once and I hated it. I hate being dirty. And my kids actually don't like being dirty, which is one of the reason I started putting them in those environments because they were really crazy about having mess. And I think that came from me. And so I can do that and I love that. And I would encourage those of you who say you can't do it to just do it, like let them be kids. However, with that said, again, not praising myself, I can do it when I am in control of the situation, when it is strategized and planned and set and I've prepared my heart and my mind for mess, I can handle it. When it is not planned for, again, I'm not talking about disrespect or destroying anything that is yours because we're called to take care of what God has given us and entrusted us with. I'm not saying to let your kids destroy things. But what I'm saying is when a mess isn't in your control and it's really not that big of a deal, can we deal with it better? Can we let them be children? Can we allow them the freedom to express themselves and touch things and get dirty? Um, So a few examples of this, I'll share two. One, Saxon has found the water hose and he's figured out how to turn it on. So every single day he comes and it's so frustrating because he doesn't like being wet. And yet he turns on the hose and completely soaks himself. And then he comes crying to me because he's wet. So the first few times I just got so frustrated. I'm like, stop soaking yourself, Saxon. And he's like such a little ham. He's, he's like just my best friend right now. He's attached at my hip. And so I get frustrated, but then I laugh, but then I'm still internally like, oh my gosh, Jesse, is there a way to turn this hose off permanently? Like how is there a nozzle we can adjust, whatever. And I'm mad. But then I realize like, why do I care? Because I have to take his clothes off and get a towel and dry him off. It takes me two minutes to do that. Why do I get so stressed out about it initially when I see him? And part of me is thinking, well, he doesn't really like it. But then when I really like step back, he's exploring. He's two years old. He's exploring things on his own. He's figuring out what he likes. He's, he's just, he likes it for the time and he doesn't like being soaked. And so every single day now that he comes, I'm like, Lord, help me to let Saxon be a kid. Help me to let him just enjoy his childhood and be a little kid. Um, And that's just been a blessing for me. Again, not perfect at it. There are chocolate stains and like blackberry stains all over my white curtains. And that to me is like destructive and not being careful with what you've been given. And so they get in trouble for doing that. But I also don't want to allow my home to be an idol to me. I don't want people to feel uncomfortable, including my children, in my home like they can't live. Like a home is for living. And so let us let our children live and get messy and hose them down with a hose when they're covered in mud and throw them in the bath. Like it, it could be so much worse. You guys, like they're just enjoying their lives and Again, everything in moderation. I'm not saying cover your kids in paint every day, obviously, but maybe just giving a little bit more freedom to them and to yourself to let them be kids and to let them remember this messy, fun, joyful childhood is so sweet because those moments for us, like those mud fights, those food fights, those paint days, like 
those are really sweet memories for me and for Sutton because he remembers Saxon doesn't yet. But we have those memories and we have pictures and that's childhood. And so let us give them more freedom to be kids. Number three, raising my voice. I hate talking about this, you guys. This is where I'm going to get emotional. So I'm not a screamer. I'm just going to like clarify. I'm not a screamer. I don't throw things. I don't, I, I wouldn't say I lash out. But like I said, I can go from zero to 100 so quickly with my agitation and my frustration. And I take it out on my babies. And when they are screaming and crying or when they're fighting, because guys, the fighting kills me. <laughs> you can see me, I'm being very theatrical right now, but you can see on my YouTube channel, by the way. It kills me. Like it drives me up the wall. And everyone tells me, oh, it's only going to get worse, which is just so defeating, honestly. Um, but I feel like the investment now and the instruction now and the constant redirecting will pay off. It will pay off. Does that stop me from getting frustrated? No. And so yelling, I mentioned earlier, I talked to a counselor and I talked to her about everything. It's just like the most freeing thing, you guys, to have someone to just vent to who knows scripture and can point me toward Jesus and can just listen to me vent so I'm not pouring that out onto my family or my friends. So highly recommend a counselor if you can. But I've talked to her about this a lot. And she never guilts me or makes me feel like I'm one of a kind because apparently this is an issue with a lot of mamas, but I don't want it to be okay. You know, like I don't want it to be just, this is who I am as a mom and I'm accepting it and I'm embracing it and the kids are going to have to deal with it because I see comments like that on Facebook and they really dishearten me because I don't feel like that is what God has called us to. God is is slow to anger and he calls us to be slow to speak and slow to anger because anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And we want to produce in our children the righteousness of God. And I just feel like Jesus in my heart so heavily as I talk about this, because I, even just with isolation, the child abuse being rampant right now, it is devastating. And I don't want my children and I don't want your children to grow up thinking that screaming at one another is normal. That includes you and your spouse. That includes you at toward your children and your children toward you. And so it's never too late to start over, but it's really going to take a heart change. And so for me, there have just been a lot of things that I've navigated through, um, and one is a counselor, like I said. Two is talking to my husband about it. Like when I fail, I go to my husband immediately and I'm like, I screwed up. I feel guilty. I feel the weight. And he will walk me through just like, okay, what triggered you so much in that moment that like you had to just respond that way with like, stop fighting, <laughs> you know? Um, and one thing that my counselor told me that was really helpful was like, Lindsay, if they're fighting or they're yelling or they're screaming or they're throwing a fit in their room, they've already been doing it. So what is one more second for one more minute for you to take your breath, take a saw breath and compose your thoughts because you can't be emotional and logical at the same time, friends. Did you know that? It's a fact. So you can't be emotional and logical at the same time. So take a second to take a deep breath, compose yourself, and then think logically about how you want to handle the situation and walk in. Rather than screaming from your bedroom or your room, I told you to stop or please stop or anything. Like the way that we respond to behavior is so much more important than the behavior itself because that teaches our children how to live. That teaches patience. It teaches empathy. It teaches understanding. It teaches logic. It teaches patience. And so when we are responding impatiently, aggressively, that's what they're learning. I mean, that's what we're teaching them ultimately. Um, and so she, that encouragement really helped me um, to just take a second. Like if the world is ending and they're going to hurt each other, obviously you intervene immediately, like really hurt each other. 
But if they've already been doing their thing, my nose is really shiny. But if they've obviously been doing their thing already and they're okay, then just give yourself another second before you respond. And it can take a massive, massive weight off of your shoulders to be the fixer and the problem solver. Because realistically, our children need to learn how to solve their own problems anyways. So that's been helpful. And then repenting to my kids. And I talk about this in like every motherhood episode, but repenting to my kids is huge. I go to Sutton and you guys, I have a video of it. Excuse me. I had a really horrible day and it was during isolation. I was so overwhelmed by work, which is usually when my frustration comes out. And I just was awful to Sutton all day. Like I was really irritated with him. I don't think I yelled too much. I was just like basically annoyed at everything he did. And it's crazy that you can feel that way towards someone you love so much, right? But I was just agitated at him and he was in a mood. And so we both were like clashing and we already kind of butt heads because we're really similar. And so that night I just went to him and I didn't even want to apologize because my heart was so hardened that day. But I felt the conviction and the Holy Spirit just saying, apologize to him. You need to ask for forgiveness. This is where he will learn. And so I sat on his floor and we were about to read our book for the night. And I just told him, Sut, I'm so sorry. Like, this isn't who God has called me to be. He didn't call me to be quick to anger. He calls me to be patient and endlessly loving and kind and gracious. And I said, but God's kindness leads me to repentance. And I want my kindness to be an example to you, or I, I'm sorry, I want my repentance to be an example to you of who God is to me, because I'm never going to be a perfect mama, but I'm trying my best. And you guys know what he said after I was just like so sharp with him all day. He said, and I just, I wrote it down in my notes and I even shared it with my mom and my sister, but he just said, Mom, I will never, ever ask for another mommy. You are just the mommy that I want. And I'm like, how humbling after just feeling like a piece of trash all day and getting to the end of the night and thinking like, God, this is what you've bestowed upon me. Like, this is what you've called me to. And I am massively failing today. And like that grace that Sutton gave me and saying, you're just the mom I want even though I failed him all day, is like just the most humbling thing. And it redirects my heart. And so if you guys aren't repenting to your kids when you're disrespectful toward them, because kids deserve respect too, when you're unkind, fix it. Like change that. Just go and repent. And I'm not putting myself on a high horse and saying, I repent, so you need to repent. I am saying the act is humbling and heart changing. And if you want your heart to change, then set your mind on Jesus and set your heart on Jesus and he will transform your heart towards your children. It is massive. The book Give Them Grace by Elise Fitzpatrick is so good because it focuses on the gospel truth that our kids aren't bad just because their character is bad and they're not good because they have a good day. It is bad because of sin and good because of God's goodness. And if we can stop focusing on their character and like them being bad or them being good, we can fix our perspective to navigate through these really hard issues in a better, more loving, more understanding way. And so that was Give Them Grace by Elise Fitzpatrick. It is life-changing. We don't, just like last point, we don't want to attribute their sin to who they are because we can hate their sin and love them endlessly. And so how do we work through the separation of those two things is what she goes through in her book. Whew, that was heavy. Okay. Um, number four, speaking about them. So Jesse and I've noticed these little things like Saxon is such a picky eater and we'll say it in front of him, right? Um, Sutton is so emotional. We'll say it in front of him or we used to. Until I don't know what it was that was like a realization moment for us. Maybe someone had mentioned it in a teaching or something, but where we realize like what we say about our children is what they believe about themselves. And so what are we speaking to them? And I'm sure you guys have seen this meme and I'm going to butcher it, but it basically says something along the lines of what you speak 
about your children is who they are. So talk to them like they're the best, kindest, smartest, most amazing child in the world. And that's what they will become. And I can hear people now like, oh, my kid's not going to be entitled. They're not going to be getting third place trophies. I think everyone needs to know like life can be hard and they can, they're going to lose and they're not always the best. Like they're sinful. But if our children know they're sinful and they know that like what the gospel says that they were broken from the day they were born, um, nobody has to tell a two-year-old tantrum like, or see a two-year-old tantrum and say they're not sinful. I mean, that shows what it is. They weren't taught to be selfish. They're just selfish. And so if we acknowledge that and yet still love them like Jesus loves us with unconditional love and support and kindness and grace, then they live that out. They learn to live that out. And that also flows into how we speak about them. And so whether you speak about them behind closed doors what were the words that you say during that time will affect your heart and how you feel and act towards your children. Okay. And then what, and I'm not like trying to teach again. I have to always be so careful. Like I'm not teaching from a place of I've got this figured out. I am teaching from a place of like, Lord, help me figure this out and let me bring all the mamas who listen on this, to this podcast along with me in this journey of like growing to live in excellence and in joy and in purpose. Cause that is my whole heart for all of you who listen. Um, But the way that we speak about them behind closed doors transforms our heart. The way that we speak about them in person and in front of them transforms their heart. So what do we say about our children that impacts them? Do we speak good? Do we build up? Like the Bible says to use your words to build up and not tear down. Do we build our kids up with our words? Do we encourage them and tell them how intelligent they are and how kind they are and do we praise the good, the goodness in them that we see when God is moving and we see uh, like the sneaky thing with Sutton? I was like, I sat, got on his level and looked him in the eyes. I said, I want you to know how proud I am of you that without knowing I was there, you stood for your morals and your values and what you believed in. And there's nothing more important than that. Like you knew that that was more important than pleasing a friend or pleasing people. You stood for what you valued. And that is huge. And I just like praised and praised and praised. And Jesse always says, I overpraise my kids. But I'm like, you know what? If we're consistent in discipline, if we're consistent in guiding and restructuring and pointing them toward good, I think praise is the most beautiful thing because kids just learn to, to just see good instead of seeing the negative. Because when we're constantly giving negative feedback about not doing this right and not doing this right and not doing this right, what do they feel? They feel like they're never good enough. So yes, we give constructive criticism and we discipline when necessary, but we also build our children up with good and kind and compassionate words. Number five, trying to fix them rather than allowing them to be who they are. Do you guys ever find that you try to mold your kids into who you want them to be instead of who God made them to be? So this is something that I have struggled with again. All of these are my struggles. You guys, okay, you're seeing into my life as a mom that I do not have it all together. And I have high expectations of myself I have always had incredibly high expectations of myself. I am an Enneagram three for anyone who follows the Enneagram. I am an achiever and always just striving, right? And it tears me down a lot of the time. And I have like literally transferred that over to my oldest son. Oh, I have wanted him to live up to the expectation that I have for him. That means I have put a lot of heavy burden on him when it comes to learning things, which again, everything in moderation, you guys, I think it's great. I think he's a smart kid and I've like honed in on that and seen that. But I think there's also a place where I just haven't let him be a kid in the way that I would want him to be. Um, Literally, as I talk about this, I feel like my heart is a thousand pounds because It's like when you start to step back from something that you've struggled with and you see it more clearly, it can feel really heavy. 
But the place I'm at now in talking to you guys about this is like a place of healing where I'm seeing what I've done. I'm seeing that expectation in treating him like he's 16 years old instead of four. And it's funny, even my friends, you guys will tell me, it's crazy that Sutton is four years old. Like he just doesn't act, talk, anything like a four-year-old. And I'm not going to sit and blame myself for that, but I think there's a piece of me that has really not allowed him for a while to be that little boy because I wanted him to be more. I wanted him to do more and achieve more. And like, that's not what life is about. And I've just, as I'm healing from that and as I'm taking the reins off and thank God, my husband is just incredible. And like, is always just like, Lynn's let them be kids. You know, let them be kids. And with my second, it's so much easier because I see like, he's going to get it figured out. Like Sutton got it figured out. He figured it out. You know, I don't need to control every detail and aspect of their lives. And I think this can be so hard when we look at other moms doing things. And I just want to like publicly apologize to anyone I've ever made feel like you don't have it all together just because I do these activities or I'm teaching Sutton to read or whatever it is. Like everyone has their own path. And just because it's right for me does not mean it's right for you. And just because it's right for that blogger mama or super mama, whoever you're looking over the fence at, doesn't mean you're wrong for doing it your way. And like, there's just real freedom in tuning into Jesus and the Holy Spirit and like who he's called you to be as a mom and sitting in that prayer and in your Bible and saying, who am I as so-and-so's mom and who do I want to be? And that's enough. Like it doesn't, it's not determinate on what somebody else does. And so for me, I'm just learning that development and emotional maturity and independence are messy. Sutton's growth, Saxon's growth, your children's growth is going to be messy. It's going to be confusing. It's going to be a massive roller coaster of ups and downs. And sometimes it's super frustrating, but when we try as parents to fix them rather than shape them and then allow them to live as an individual, it crushes their spirit a little bit. And I just think like, I always go back to this. If my kid isn't saved and he doesn't love Jesus, he's either going to not love Jesus and live his life on his own, or he's going to not love Jesus and live life alongside me still with my love and support. And I just see that so much. Like the Bible talks about, yes, sin and hell and repentance. Those are very real things. And I want people to know the gravity of them because I love them. But the Bible also talks about grace and forgiveness and love. And we look at the prodigal son who left his father and spent all of his money and ran rampant and did horrible things. And the second he walked back in the door, his father embraced him in a hug. And I actually gave that verse to Jesse on a necklace with both of the boys' names from Etsy. And it's so cute. And it's the verse where he's embracing him and welcoming him back home. And so for those of you with older children, like that, that, that story from scripture is so powerful and impactful because that support and that love and fostering that from a young age and letting them know they can come to you about anything really will be the foundation of your relationship. And so I desperately want my kids to see how supported and loved they are and that no matter what decisions that they make, I will always guide them in the right direction and I will never stop sharing what I believe to be true. But I will also embrace them no matter what. And that support is so beautiful because that shows the love of Jesus. I truly, truly believe that. And so rather than maybe always trying to fix, we can substitute that with prayer. And the prayers of a mama, you guys, there's nothing like it. Like I've been on my face for my kids before with their sickness and just with their hearts and their futures. And that prayer is more powerful than anything we can do to try to like squash their spirit 
because of who we expect or want them to be. So with that said, I want us women to be a beacon of light and joy for our families. If you haven't noticed, you probably often set the tone for your home. You wake up in a bad mood and stressed out and raising your voice, it's likely to follow throughout the home. But if you have a sense of peace and calm, and this might be easier for some than others, it will be easier for some than others, that spirit is a light to our family. It's a light of hope. It's a light of joy. It's a light of I don't have it all together, but I'm fighting the fight to choose goodness and choose excellence as a mama because I am an example to my family. Motherhood, you guys, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And if we try to make it a sprint, we are going to grow really, really weary. And the most beautiful part of this, and I wrote about this on my Instagram last night, is that we are not intended to live this life as moms without rest. There are days where I just don't want to be touched again. At the end of the night, I mean, often, I am like checked out. 12 hour day. I sat for a good 20 minutes, maybe during that time. And I am tired. But when I try to fill myself with Netflix or just with mindless scrolling on my phone, am I really being fulfilled? Um, I think we as a society have a tendency to rely on crutches like wine or even coffee sometimes to say, this is the only thing getting me through the day. But if we are soaking ourselves in the living water, so to speak, in God's word and really refreshing our hearts and our minds at the beginning of the day or whenever you can, we're not going to need that rest as much because our burden is light because God is carrying it. So your children aren't going to arrive at either at any point and neither will you. You're not going to arrive It's going to change and shift and each season is hard in a different way and each season is beautiful in a different way. So don't expect to just get there and arrive and just be like, it's easy, you know, because the purpose of motherhood truly is to sanctify us and to make us better and stronger. It's the in-between of the journey that the beauty of parenthood lies. And so we just have to fight for that goodness and fight to accept that the process is what it is and that the discomfort in the struggle of parenthood is what strengthens us. And so use that discomfort, use these lessons. Like if any of these points just triggered your heart and made you feel that sense of conviction, step back and say, okay, Lord, like this is a good thing. I am not a horrible mom. If all five of them resonated with you, you should not step back and say, I suck. I give up. (laughs) right? Because if that were the case, then I would do that. But instead, I am able to use the comfort that God has given me to try and provide comfort to you and say, that's a good thing. Like the fact that you're willing to acknowledge that you're struggling with the expectations of your children or struggling with yelling or whatever it might be, that is a good thing so that you can step back and heal because that is where God has you. He wants you to heal through the process of motherhood. And so embrace the struggle, embrace the hard, embrace the struggle and move forward from it and allow healing. And you guys, like I said, my heart with this community is for us to never stay where we're at. I don't want you to walk away from this and not implement things. And so I just want to challenge, listen back or, or take notes or whatever it might be. And acknowledge where you can grow and take action, whether it's repentance, whether it's asking for accountability, whether it's seeking out a counselor or talking to a friend about things that you've been ashamed to say out loud. Allow yourself the opportunity for growth and embrace the struggle so that you can live and love more like the mom that God has called you. I don't know why I feel so heavy right now. Maybe hopefully it's because this is just going to like bless other mamas. I pray that that's the case, but I just want you guys to know that I love you. I'm here for you. Um, If you haven't had a chance to rate and review or share the podcast, please take a second to do so. If you have mamas, new mamas or soon to be mamas, foster mamas, moms who are in the later seasons of life, 
um, I just ask that you share with them and allow them to hear that there is hope today and that there is an opportunity to start fresh because God's mercies are new every morning. And lastly, um, I've been asked multiple times how to donate to the podcast, how to contribute to this ministry. You can go to patreon.com backslash living easy. The link is in my bio on Instagram and also in the show notes here on iTunes um, and then also on YouTube. So if you are able to contribute even as much as a cup of coffee each month to keep this ministry going, to keep the podcast going, it would mean so much. I love you guys. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you next week.